Hello and welcome to Moonfair's webinar today about the topic of how private equity can make the most of an economic downturn. My name is Johanna Stolberg, I lead PR efforts at Moonfair and I will be speaking today with Steffen Pohls, CEO and founder at Moonfair. Steffen Pohls has many years of experience in private equity and founded Moonfair in 2016 in order to give private investors and their advisors access to private equity as an asset class. Hi, Stefan. Good of you to join us today. How are you? Thanks, Yoyo. Great. Great to have you. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and there will be a Q&A session at the end of my conversation with Stefan where the audience can ask questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the Q&A window of this call, and we will try to address them in the Q&A session afterwards. What are the topics we will be talking about today? Firstly, we will be looking at the current market backdrop and what it means for future returns. Then we will look at the reasons why private equity is resilient in times of economic downturn. And lastly, we will look at the lessons learned from the financial recession in 2008, when Stefan was an executive at KKR. All right, let's jump right in. Stefan, we are currently seeing tremendous macro and geopolitical changes leading to changing financial conditions. Markets are confronted with risks such as inflation, the war in Ukraine, and in general, increased volatility. You are having numerous discussions with senior investors from the PE, the hedge fund, and the venture industries. So could you set the stage for us briefly? Of course, Yoyo. Look, you said it. We have the privilege at Moonfair due to our, uh, due to our long-standing relationships with the private equity, but also venture landscape, that we are getting their views and we are talking to some of the brightest and most successful investors in the world. And I think there's one thing that one can dare uh, to say, which is that the overarching theme really, and most of them tend to agree on this, is it feels like a perfect storm. Probably stating the opposite here, but look, Think of it, we have not seen these inflation rates for decades and inflation, and this is the common view, is not going to go away anytime soon. A lot will depend on the ability of the companies to pass on their cost pressure to the final consumers. But in turn, that's good for the company, but of course, it's creating another wave of inflation. And then, of course, there's a risk of a wage, a price spiral, and we have uh, further risks in terms of more and further shortages on the supply side. Impacting inflation, though fundamentally different in nature, of course, is also the geopolitical environment with its impact on the global value chains. Some people say globalization is over, or at least it comes to a halt for a while. But it will be reserved on some ends, that's for sure. Future global chains, will be significantly different uh, in terms of supply chains than in the past. Think about energy, think about healthcare, semiconductors, just to name a few. In all these sectors, we are seeing as we speak broken value chains across the globe. The breakup and the rebuild of those global value chains will take time. This is nothing that comes overnight. Probably we are talking about three, maybe four, could be five years. So it will be years before we see some sort of normalization. And at interim, of course, as globalization is working against inflation, globalization is bringing inflation down, this will drive inflation up. China's no uh, case uh, zero COVID policy uh, is obviously not helpful. And uh, we will clearly see that this policy will have an impact on China's ability to grow. What probably personally concerns me most is the risk of social unrest, and in particular a global food crisis which is already on the horizon. I'll give you just one stat I came across uh, the other day. As we speak, there are 2 million tons of crop in the Ukraine rotting. 
Only 50,000 of those will be saved and can be and will be exported and reach destinations that are in desperate need for food. And then broader uh, political landscape, there is, of course, people do see a risk of a further right-wing shift in the political landscape and more populism coming our way. Just think about the next election in France. Look, it looks like after close to 12 years of more or less continuous growth in prosperity, it seems that our arsenal of weapons is exhausted. More quantitative easing, lower interest rates, absolutely unlikely. I would say impossible in light of the, the inflation. China growth, some hope there, but I doubt that this will save us this time. And governmental spending, look, in light of the incredible increase in terms of rescue programs we saw post-COVID, this is not very likely to mitigate the impact that we are seeing ahead of us. It, it is a little bit, and this is what, what I discussed also with, with our GBs, we lived a little bit in a great past at the cost of the future. However, there are signs of hopes, and uh, I'm convinced the world will not go under. The Western world obviously is far more unified than a decade ago and is standing up against Putin. The world, of course, will reinvent itself with respect to the global value chains and massive investments, including governmental spending, will be needed for this transition. In particular, in the healthcare, of course, in the energy, but also military spending will definitely increase. And this will lead to, though more expensive, jobs being created in the Western Hemisphere. And then China might help the global economy more than currently anticipated, as they have, as I said, to grow to maintain political stability. In short, the good news is probably no one on earth, maybe except of Putin, really wants this perfect storm to happen. But at least, yo yo, short to midterm, these will be tough times. Right. In light of this macro assessment, would you walk us through what you are hearing in the private equity world? Is, are these developments already priced in? How are markets reacting? Yeah, look, there's an interesting phenomenon um, that uh, I've been discussing and hearing more and more. Uh, you see that public markets came down. Uh, you know, the S&P 500 is 20% down. We have seen the third largest Nasdaq uh, drawdown in 20 years. However, there is still a discrepancy between public markets and private markets. Again, private markets have reacted much quicker. They are already down and I think facing and probably closer to the bottom a new reality. <clears throat> in many cases, I hear that prices you know, for new assets now in the buyout segment are down 30% and even more. You have followed this in the private markets, in growth, in tech. We are even talking about a compression of some 60%. Over 60%, just one start of all software, internet, and tank companies are trading currently below pre-pandemic 2020 prices. You've heard and probably followed the news, Klarna, one of the most successful fintech companies in Europe, just did a down round at half of their original price, and there's more to come. So we have seen a very, very steep drop in valuations and in prices in public markets, but the decline has not been as pronounced, similar to what we've seen in private markets. And look, my read here is either the guys from the private size do, do get it wrong, or public markets have not yet adapted fully to the new reality and will decline further. And that's the camp I am in. I am in the latter camp. Mm -hmm. OK, so what does this mean for general partner sentiments overall? And looking at private equity more specifically, and at the topic of this webinar, what are the key factors that make this asset class uh, resilient to an economic downturn? Or maybe even more so, how can private equity investors generate higher returns through such an economic downturn? Look, Yoyo, of course, private markets are not entirely decoupled from, from, from public markets. That's, that's clear. And they are correlated to some degree. But what we see is, and also we've seen it in historical data, that private market valuations tend to follow public markets often in a more, call it, limited capacity. They are more resilient thanks to active ownership and what is referred also in the literature to the active uh, governance model that's behind it. And let me explain this for the audience and probably many 
uh, of the people listening into this webinar are, are aware of it. But you know, the major source of creation, of value creation in private equity is not leverage. It's not even multiple expansion, so buying cheap and selling high. It is actually EBDA expansion, so growth, profitable growth. Growth. And the reason why this model is so successful, and you are seeing this in the historical data, you typically have an outperformance of the best private equity funds of some 8 to 10 percent versus public markets. The reason is really, you know, uh, the governance model. Yeah? The owner sits um, together with the management on the table, quick uh, decision making. Um, there's mm -hmm. alignment of interest because the managers are being incentivized as if they were really the owners of the business. That changes incredible their behavior. Uh, you don't have this principal agent issue. Uh, and then, of course, you know the major players, they are global. They have operational resources at hand. They have playbooks uh, that they can um, you know, implement uh, across their portfolio. You know, speaking to the industry, they have already developed and talked to all their portfolio companies to adapt to the new reality. There are already contingency measures in implementation as we speak. And there are even more so uh, you know, financial plans, contingency plans, if the world is darkening. Uh, that have been developed. So this active ownership, yeah. And another, you know, example. Uh, back to my times at KKR, private equity sits you know, and is in interactions with their portfolio companies on a on a weekly basis and not on a quarterly basis, as it is the case in in the public markets. And think about when all these resources, when this very active, close approach, when is it needed most? Of course not in the sunshine times. It's needed, you know, when a stormy weather is arriving. And this is why mm -hmm. private equity is so well equipped currently for what is, uh, you know, to, um, yet to come. And let me quote here what I like, this quote from Arian Senna. He said, you cannot overtake 15 cars in sunny weather, but you can when it's raining. And this is exactly what the private equity industry will do. The current valuation reset, of course, offers opportunities for them. And the newly launched funds or the funds that are currently in fundraising are exactly investing into the next three, four years, which is the typical investment period of a recession period. They can invest at lower valuations. And look, data from the past crisis, and um, this is you know based on, on the research, but that's also out in the scientific uh, literature, they show that, you know, just before a crisis, the multiple LBTAs, they, they come down already. And this is what we are seeing in the market. And this will probably continue for the next one, at least, uh, if not two years. So private equity is in a decent position. You know, they sit on record levels of dry powder. They have the ability to deploy capital very flexible. Uh, you know, currently uh, uh, a concern or a, challenges, a challenge the industry is facing is there is literally close to no financing available. But think about how the private equity industry, uh, the Blackstones, the KKRs, the Carlites, how they have developed since the financial crisis. And they now have and maintain their own pool of capitals for all sorts of transactions, including credit, including debt, including, um, of course, um, tailored private equity uh, uh, pools and they can move fast. So what's happening is we will see, of course, lower leverage because financing is down, but we have a fast moving industry. We will see more probably public to privates because public valuations came down. And as I said, the expectation is there's more to come. So it's a bit too early to see this, but also, you know, consolidation. One of the strengths of private equity players is really their M&A competence and their global footprint. So they will consolidate certain industries and in, the, in which they are active. And all this is reflected if you look back in the past cycles and we went back to, you know, the dot-com crisis, you can see that the best vintages, yeah, they are from exactly the turning points in the cycle. So 2001, excellent vintage. 2008, 2009, post-financial crisis, very similar. And this is now exactly what institutional investors want to capture. They go long into private equity. But let's not think only, and then I pause you know, about the buyout segment, also think about other um, adjacent asset classes as infrastructure uh, or think about real estate. You know, They provide a natural hedge against inflation. And probably will perform very, very well in the years to come. Okay, very interesting. 
Um, so you said private equity vintages raised in recession have historically performed well. Most recently, this was with market conditions with historically low interest rates. So how do you think will private equity's ability to insulate portfolio companies you mentioned um, be impacted by rising rates and borrowing costs? Yeah, look, that is, of course, you know, uh, a factor that is currently working against private equity. But let me put it into perspective. Look, first, let's think about it. The past 10 to 12 years, I always call it honeymoon land. I can hardly see and could hardly identify a private equity fund that didn't deliver at least 2x uh, in terms of uh, return on invested capital. And there is a funny quote I came uh, across the other day from a senior private equity uh, leader. He was saying, I've been working with some of my senior investment analysts and principals now over the past 10 years very intensely, but I still do not know whether they are really great investors. And this is why, you know, the, the secular trend that was driving the returns really in the past, that is really, that, that didn't allow so much to differentiate really the great players from the more average players. Mm -hmm. No doubt to your question, rising rates, look, it's poison, will clearly have a negative impact on private equity uh, because of the uh, loan um, costs behind it. But put it into perspective where we are, we are still at levels in the historical context and private equity goes back to the early 60s, uh, 80s in the past century, as you know. So we are talking about a 40 year horizon. And of course, in most 80% uh, of the times, interest rates were much higher then, you know, even the current levels and the levels that are expected to uh, to come. But private equity still outperformed also in, in, in these uh, phases. What is important now, and this is really different from the past 10 years, more than ever, there will be some players that are more challenged, that have less access to pools of capital, less, less long-standing relationships with banks and other finance providers, and they will, you know, do uh, worse than, than others that are better equipped and, and you know, we, we are looking and we are, in, as you know, you're investing a lot of uh, time and resources. Now is the time to identify the managers that are equipped for the stormy weather. And this is, you know, why we run this rigorous uh, selection process. And think about the KKRs, I said it, the Blackstones, the EQTs, the Carlites, the Apollos. They all have uh, still access to all sorts of capital. They have operational know-how. They have their resources. They have their established governance uh, models. They have experts from supply chain down to purchasing uh, uh, digital migration. And what we like uh, about them is their global footprint. So they can play consolidation and they can help their portfolio companies on a, on a global basis. You need now in these days to have a very differentiated approach to generate alpha. The honeymoon times also for certain private equity companies are over. Now the skill set and the resources really of the you know, best players are, are asked and demanded. Look, the tech and growth segment, of course, is, is different. It's slightly different. It's far more impacted by the rise of, rise of uh, interest rates, um, given you know the forward-looking cash flow uh, and uh, DCF models uh, that they are applying. And it's absolutely realistic, and and uh, it would be naive not to expect haircuts in the valuations in the current portfolios of venture capital companies. But this is all past, yeah, and we can't change this. Uh, going forward, there is also in tech a huge uh, opportunity. Valuations came down across the board. I said it, we are down in the private market 60% and more. Uh, but tech, look, tech is a secular trend. And we have seen this dot-com crisis. We've seen that in post-financial crisis. People were always saying, look, tech is dead. Yeah, I'm going now and back to the industrial company world. This is wrong. And uh, history has proven that these people were wrong. It's a secular trend. Just 10% of the global GDP so far has been disrupted by, by the internet and by tech. And if you talk to experts in the Silicon Valley uh, from the leading venture and tech funds, they expect this number of disruption in terms of GDP volume to go up from 10% to 40%. When? Nobody knows. But probably a time horizon of 10, 15 years. So we are talking about four times more opportunities in tech than we are facing today. That's a lot. And as I said, valuations are down, and now is the time to invest. Okay. So considering all this, what is your outlook for vintages in the coming years? 
Look, I said it. No one knows the future, of course. Yeah, And uh, what I'm referring to, and of course the industry players are referring to, is a lot of thinking and insights from the past based on data. But uh, I can tell you how the most sophisticated institutional professional investors are behaving. And that was also reflected in many discussions we had at Super Return and other occasions. They go long. They go even longer than, than you know the year before. Because based on their experience, they know that with all likelihood, these vintages or the vintages to come are probably the best uh, in terms of private equity investments that you can do. Look, the direction of travel, and we talked about it in the beginning, of course, we are, the world is in disorder, uh, in fundamental disorder, on a political level, on a financial level, and on, a, uh, on an economic level. So uh, no one knows what the future will bring. Um, and uh, it depends, of course, on the war. It depends on uh, relationship and, uh, you know, how, how China and the U.S. really find a new uh, basis. And if they do so, that's the key thing. And then, of course, how long it takes to repair all these broken global value chains. Okay. So uh, now let's talk a bit about your experience. You have a lot of uh, experience in private equity and um, you've also experienced the last global financial crisis during that time you were at KKR. Um, so that's very interesting. Do you think you could take us through late 2008, 2009, when the crisis hit from the perspective of a GP? How does the dynamic of managing portfolios, portfolio companies change um, when you enter a bear market? How does one look for new opportunities, but also um, what are the top priorities and do they change to, to how they were before? Look, there's one interesting observation that, that I want to share before I go into this question. Yo, yo, um, it's interesting because most of the senior managers that you know managed the um, post mortem, so to say, of the financial crisis in terms of portfolio, and I will talk about it uh, in a sec, they are still in charge. And that really is a great, great, great point because these people have the experience from one of the largest crises in the past 20 years. So what the industry was doing, and it's exactly the same pattern that we are seeing with one big exception, and I will talk about it in a, in a sec, is portfolio, portfolio, portfolio. Full focus on portfolio, contingency plans, left, right, center. They should uh, pull you know, uh, any financing you can get. They're revolving credit facilities, optimize of working capital, focus on what matters most, but of course also some restructuring, cost optimization, whether it's on the purchasing side uh, in terms of renegotiation. But you know, this is all happening, by the way, as we speak in an incredible speed of reaction. I'm not so familiar and I don't want to judge about public companies, but I would be surprised if the speed with which the adaption is happening uh, to a new reality would be uh, similar, at least in all private uh, or public markets companies. Uh, you know, we heard the first time about prepare for the worst, develop contingency plans, um, go into crisis mode as early as, as March, April, and then it was executed. Uh, and this is, you know, not only in the buyout world, every uh, sophisticated venture growth investor is, is doing the same. Uh, so what will happen is a rigorous focus on the portfolio, but of course, at the same time, uh, there are many opportunities. I mentioned consolidation, I mentioned private to public and more, pu public to private and more. Okay. And um, looking back how um, at the time, how do you think private equity was prepared, um, if, if they were at all, for this shock that global economies experienced after the market crash? Look, I think the honest answer is that probably no one was prepared and uh, was adapting uh, what, what, what happened. Uh, again, first we saw, you know, uh, a very grim view back uh, when the financial crisis started of experts and GPs and senior private equity people in the US. They were the first to adjust to the new reality that then, you know, the wave came over, as everyone knows, to, to Europe. Uh, we had the credit agencies that were, you know, forecasting dozens of defaults in the economy. Um, we know that, you know, these doomsday 
a scenario really never never realized you know and and the private equity industry uh, i think it reinvented itself again uh, you know uh, access to capital yeah they they you know um, they were leaning on their long standing relationships i said earlier the industry has incredibly developed since then because now they have their own uh, and highly differentiated pools of capital uh, the entire secondary market you know has evolved uh, since then think about the collars and the lexingtons uh, and then there is an interesting analysis from mckinsey that i want to share uh, because it's it, uh, they have analyzed you know the period during the financial crisis and they looked into uh, various private equity players and they differentiated very simplistically between those that have their own value creation teams, uh, own resources at hand, so experts that support the company in their transformation and manage the crisis together with them, and those that have not had these resources. And they discovered a 5%, 5% IRR difference between those that were equipped, and I talked earlier about you know the governance model and this active ownership approach and those that were not equipped look one of the biggest mistakes some not all of the private equity players made during and also you know shortly after the financial crisis was a lack of action total focus on portfolio and even those professional players in some cases didn't dare to go after the opportunities that were ahead of them um, just giving you a stat here between 2007 and 2009, the global private equity volume fell from 800 billion to 170 billion, so by 80%. And the industry, and this is a learning, you know, that I'm hearing often when I talk to senior executives out there, the industry understood that it missed a significant opportunity uh, not to acquire, back in these days, high quality assets at deep discounts. Blackstone, interestingly, and uh, to some extent also Apollo, they took a different path. They were probably amongst the most active players post-financial crisis. Yeah? And uh, KKR also, in a way, learned they have been the most active player globally in private equity post-COVID. Yeah? This is all based on the learnings from the past uh, and um, made their, their strongest investment year ever. So I do not expect the industry to make the mistake, the same mistake they have made in the past again. Uh, deployment, deployment of capital, of course, will go down. So the turnaround, the fundraising cycles will uh, become longer. But the industry this time will keep on, I'm uh, convinced, will keep on investing into the down cycle and capture the probably great buying opportunities that will be out there. Great. Um, so now to my really last question. Um, when COVID-19 hit and um, markets started plummeting, how did Moonfair react? In hindsight, is there anything you would have done differently um, or were there lessons learned or maybe what were the biggest lessons you learned from, from COVID? Look, in every crisis, the most difficult thing is, and this is a theme that I'm also constantly discussing with, with friends and, and other people, just accept the new reality. I still remember, you know, when COVID started, I, I was meeting a senior guy, by the way, from the private equity industry, and it was early Feb, so it was not yet visible what would come our way. And this guy said, this is going to be heavy. And I was thinking about it and I said, okay, let's plan for the worst and hope for the best. So we adapted very, very quickly organizationally, a home office, of course, you know, health um, uh, safety. Uh, uh, we did many, many things and we're preparing for the worst. Interestingly, as everyone knows, it was like a, a you know, V-shape uh, formation in, 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 in the stock markets. And we saw the same. People came very, very quickly back uh, and understood that this is a time probably to invest into um, private equity. We have seen you know, record month uh, post um, March, um, I still remember May, uh, we saw and uh, doubled more than the assets under management in 2020, despite, you know, um, the, the, the dip in February and March. And we started also to better, you know, appreciate and push uh, the desire of our investor base for liquidity. Because what's happening in all these phases is, you know, suddenly people are paper long and cash short. So they need cash. And this is why we launched our digital secondary marketplace uh, back in these days to give people a path to liquidity. 
Uh, look, and every period presents its opportunities. Now it's inflation protection, it's secondaries, you know, buyout, of course, and still growth and tech. Uh, what what the industry, you know, the smartest people are doing, they invest, of course, not everything at once. They split it over vintages, over managers, they diversify. Look, and if worse comes to worst and you are a moon fair customer, you still have your path um, to liquidity through the secondary marketplace. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that concludes our uh, conversation for now. And now we have quite quite a lot of questions from the audience. So um, let's jump right into those. We have a bit more time to answer these questions, which is great. Um, look into the future. One of the questions is, in the long term, say until 2027, what secular themes and trends do you think will have the biggest impact for private equity? Thinking of ESG here, you think in that direction. What's your view on that? Look, first of all, as I said earlier, it's it's all what, what's happening, the disorder in the macro environment, which of course offers uh, opportunities. What, what will happen and what has to happen? Uh, you know, Europe uh, has to become more independent when it comes to military, um, you know, standing from the US. That comes along with something that Trump was asking for years with an increase in spendings, of course, in the military sector. The second thing, and again stating the obvious, is, you know, an entire reshuffling in the energy uh, world, yeah, with huge opportunities in terms of uh, investments. The third item I would call is, uh, in another, you know, not yet for many so visible sector, there the people discovered a high dependency on China, which is healthcare, uh, medical production, medicine production, uh, and this will change. So all these, you know, um, uh, new uh, disorder and then finding the order uh, on a global uh, scope in terms of value chain construction that will offer many, many opportunities. And look, you said it, of course, ESG is one of the topics um, everywhere uh, when it comes to private equity. Uh, impact is, of course, you know, an area that will uh, emerge even more so. And then, you know, as I said, you know, um, infrastructure um, a play, of course, because there will hopefully soon a time, you know, where, where also the build up uh, in the Ukraine is, is, is coming uh, our way and will, of course, you know, um, uh, cause a lot of, of spending and a lot of uh, capital investments. Okay, great outlook. Um, then one of the next questions that we got here, interesting one, um, with the volume of private equity in VC rising, how are exit opportunities evolving, especially with a focus on uh, Germany and France? Do you like me to? No, as I understand your question, your, your, the question from the audience is about the exit opportunities, correct? Yes, exactly. In particular in Germany and France. Look, uh, yeah. let's start with the capital markets. Capital markets are, are closed, uh, not entirely, but you know, IPOs, uh, as, as everyone knows in the audience, uh, is, 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 is probably you know, not, not uh, coming soon, anytime soon back. Uh, you know, the famous Spark route, also a route to exit, uh, it is still there, but, you know, it, uh, of course, it's also suffering. Uh, you know, there will be, um, as I said, exit opportunities, uh, of course, you know, in, in consolidation place uh, that has always two sides, one buyer, one seller. Uh, but I would assume that the holding period, you know, this time, and there's no one who is investing now under pressure to exit, uh, will be probably more towards the old uh, five to seven years uh, then, you know, shorter holding periods that we have seen in particular in the growth and tech segment. So exit markets difficult, but, you know, currently probably not the time to exit for most players. It's the time to invest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then another question would be, I we already touched upon this slightly, but I think it goes more into the specific, um, to the specific asset classes. The question is, what asset classes would do well in the bear market vintage years? And then specifically buyout, value, credit, growth, early stage, or anything else? Yeah, look, it's a little bit a question of your risk appetite, as always. Yeah, uh, What we are seeing in our, and can tell you what we are seeing in our investor crowd, uh, which is very sophisticated and highly educated also with these asset classes, we see a strong demand for infra. Um, we see a strong demand for, I call it the traditional buyout segment. Uh, that's still out there. But interestingly, 
we are also seeing a very strong interest in growth. So more on the late stage side of things, because people say there will be opportunities, the best companies will be funded. And as the venture uh, players are now focusing really back to a new normal, I would call it, to reliable, sustainable business models, probably more so than they did in the past, uh, there will be opportunities. So it's growth, infra, and the traditional buyout segment. Okay. Um, now one of the next questions, it's a short one. It is, shall we be vintage agnostic or GP agnostic? Yeah, look, vintage agnostic, this again, this you probably no one can play the cycle. Yeah. And smart investors, of course, invest across vintages and don't stop investing because you you can't time uh, you know the cycle exactly. So that's probably smart. GP agnostic, I would absolutely say no. And I said it earlier, the past 10 years have been very different. Uh, in a simple language, every fool could have made 2x. Yeah, in, in private markets in, 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 in those days. Those days are over and more than ever or more than in the past 10 years. Now you need really a differentiated, very differentiated, credible approach, proven approach, I would even say from the past to generate alpha. And this is why I said we like these global players with global footprints. You know, we like people that have strong operational know-how and resources at hand. We like people that have access to different pools of capital, whether it's in-house or due to external long-standing relationships. So now it's really the time more for highly differentiated and probably in particular for very experienced, well-equipped players with experience from the past, resources and a global footprint. So manager selection is more key than ever. Is the key, okay. Um, and then, um, um, I'm just checking in here. Um, yes, so a good portion of uh, the question is, a good portion of private equity buyouts are secondary buyouts. During a recession, we know that average holding period increases. Will this not, the question is, will this not put pressure on new funds capital deployment as not enough assets are in the market? Yeah, look, I said it, uh, we saw, and that was uh, something that frankly uh, was indicating a bit to um, some exaggerations we saw in the past. We saw some funds, not all of them, but in particular in the tech and growth area, we saw them fundraising every second year. So the good old four years or five years of deployment of capital, they came down to one and a half to two years, and these people were back in the market. Um, so I would say deployment pressure will go down. Uh, people will, you know, prolongate their investment periods to what it used to be. That's at least the strong assumption. It's not anywhere two years, it's more four or five years. And that will, of course, take out uh, pressure from the market. But I said it earlier, we have this incredible restructuring or reshuffling or this disorder in, in, the, global, in the global economy. Now, you know, there will be many, many opportunities because all these connections in terms of value change in many, many industries, they have to be rebuilt. And, you know, people with a clear view on what that future looks like and how these value chains will operate and will come together in the future will, of course, have, you know, new opportunities um, in terms of targets and, and, and buying. Uh, probably, as I said earlier, as valuations are coming down, probably they will continue to come down at least a bit uh, going forward. Probably, you know, not in the first year. Uh, typical behavior is that the industry is, is you know, in, a, in a wait and see mode. But look, as we speak, we are seeing transactions and not only secondaries. Okay. Um, and then um, this is also something you've touched about. Maybe we can um, summarize it in just a few sectors. Considering all the um, all the things going on, which sectors of economy do you think will perform best in the current environment? Yeah, look, I said that everything where where you know uh, where this reshuffling or re this order is is really having a, a huge impact. Of course, uh, stating the obvious is the entire energy uh, um, uh, sector, its infrastructure. Uh, I said because mm -hmm. the investments into infrastructure will will increase. Uh, as part of this, uh, you know, um, new um, uh, global connection of, of value chains, uh, it's healthcare. 
uh, clearly still is in a way a very resilient uh, asset class, you know, and then, you know, adjacent and, and also, you know, uh, industry um, um, sub, uh, you know, um, offerings in, in the military uh, and technology segment, because there, there must be and will be an increase in spend, which will be governmental driven. Okay, so I that that's a good summary. So we had a number of sectors there. Um, now about private credit. One of the questions is, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, there was a rise of private credit as banks restricted lending. Do you think private credit will remain a popular diversifier? Look, definitely, definitely. That, that will be the same pattern. I said it earlier, you know, um, there will be some stress on the banks. Of course, you know, we will have, you know, uh, loan defaults in, in certain areas. So the lending capacity, borrowing capacity, uh, of the banks and and other you know established financial uh, players will will not be sufficient. There is a clear market for all sorts of of, of uh, private debt, definitely. In particular, when you have an increase in, in interest rates. Great, thank you. What is your view on climate tech right now? Is this a good moment to invest in? Would you say? Look, we frankly we we haven't uh, heard much about this this segment. Uh, you know, it's it's nothing where where I would really be able to to share a, a, a deep um, insight. Of course, again, stating the office, climate is a secular trend. Uh, it's you know on top of of people's mind. It might be, frankly, and this would be you know very sad that this uh, trend and uh, you know all the investments necessary, uh, you know, are coming down a bit because the world is facing so many challenges, uh, call it in, in, in other areas, I hope not. So it's, it's a theme, but it's nothing where we have specific knowledge. Okay. Um, but, uh, and then we have one um, about Chinese. Then we have a question about Chinese GPs. What is your take on US LPs investing in Chinese GPs under the current macro environment? And then also more specifically to Moonfair, is Moonfair going to introduce more Chinese G GPs onto its platform? Yeah, let me start with the latter because this is in, in our control. We are not going to do this. Uh, you know, China is a country that is, you know, very, very difficult from a obviously a political stability standpoint. Uh, and we think that is, you know, maybe a wise strategy if you have established relationships into to play uh, to invest into local players but it's nothing we would touch yeah our philosophy at moonfair is more on the i would call it conservative side yeah we are we are not looking for for the new you know kit around the block we are really looking for established uh, players in stable environments where we can you know understand how they invest and how they create uh, the value for their their LPs. So I'm not saying you know uh, it's it's a, a totally stupid thing, but that's not something that that, that we would do. Look, uh, that that is a bit more of a broader question that that, that uh, you know the audience here is is raising. When you think about what's what's happening and with the war in the Ukraine, this is really you know this is is, is not what what the most in, in in my view and this is reflected by the talks to the GPs most important question is the most important question is U.S. and China, uh, and here you know all depends and this will be very very important not only from a geopolitical standpoint but of course also from a growth and economy standpoint we have to see more approximation between China and the U.S. Uh, going forward. The Trump, uh, you know, area didn't play a favorable role here, you know, and we are in a situation where is a lack of communication, it's a lack of trust between these countries in midst of a war, in midst of a potential another conflict, which is Taiwan. So it's all about how China will now behave uh, in first instance in its relationship with uh, Russia. Uh, probably many people have followed, but the second you know, the man in command in, in the foreign ministry department who was very close and a negotiator and a supporter of Russia has been dismissed. Uh, many, many people in the GP industry and in the private equity 
industry have, have been surprised uh, about the move, in particular in light of the elections in, in China in November. So the question really is, what is the bet on the US-China relationship? What is the bet on Taiwan? And then, you know, related, of course, Ukraine and, and um, uh, China's role in, in that conflict. If all this is coming to a, call it better end, or to a better relationship going forward, and that, of course, is also very much uh, in, in Biden's, you know, hands to do something at least uh, uh, about it. Uh, if you bet on this one, then, you know, probably um, um, that's, that, that might be a smart move to do more with, with China. Okay. And then uh, another one more, more spe specifically um, for Moonfair. What specific um, interventions can we expect from Moonfair for emerging PE managers that are launching first-time funds today or at this time? Look, I said it earlier, and this is probably even more true so again in, in, in this period. What you saw, uh, and maybe it's unfair, and I can say so because I also have my own little tech fund and also have, or I used to be a first-time fund. It's unfair, but post-financial crisis, you saw it, it was extremely difficult uh, to get money um, if you are a first-time fund. Uh, look, and we, we have a huge responsibility towards our investors. I'm not saying it's a contrary, by the way, if you read the data. Uh, uh, in many, many cases, emerging managers are outperforming the, the established ones in many cases. And this is why many smart investors also are supporting this segment of the market. You know, we are very much data we are analytically driven, we are tricken, uh, driven by track record, we have to understand the managers, uh, by the way, on a person by person level, we want to, de uh, to follow them, we have to understand their philosophy, we want to understand how they mark. We really take uh, and leave no stone unturned when it comes to due diligence. We need a longer period of data, of experience with a manager, to you know, come to a positive decision to put someone onto the Moonfair platform. And this is why I said earlier, Moonfair is more on the conservative end. I'm not saying it's not conservative to play with, a, um, with an emerging manager, but this is currently nothing for us. We are focusing on the established players in the industry where we have clear understanding of the recipes, how they generate alpha. Okay, understood. Um, Here's one that I uh, myself also find very interesting. If now is a great time for private equity investment, what about people who invested two quarters back? So when uh, public markets were at peak, do you have a assessment for that? Yeah, look, it's an it's again a very interesting one. And by the way, um, um, a point, um, a theme that that is being discussed very often in the industry. It depends, it depends, it depends. Yeah, yeah we have signed, and I don't want to name, uh, you know, um, the GPs and probably everyone is reading the press. We have seen some, some you know, exaggerations, by the way, in particular in, in uh, my personal view in 2021, uh, towards the end. We saw, you know, suddenly in the growth segment, when it came to software investments, uh, software as a service, we saw, uh, you know, exaggerations of up to 40 times forward-looking revenue. 40, 40. Revenue, not EBDA or something. So, um, you know, the long term average in that industry uh, in terms of multiple is 10. So it, it, it tells you a story. And we have seen these exaggerations. Look, uh, it depends on the player. And I come back to this point in a sec. And it depends, of course, of how much has been deployed when the prices were still high. So I think you are still in very good shape if you have, you know, the more recent vintages, uh, of course. And then, you know, the earlier vintages have benefited from the incredible uh, growth in many, many, many segments. Uh, so I don't say that the old vintages will be necessarily bad. And in many cases, by the way, uh, just the contrary. But it brings me back to one point, And this is exactly why I have said we want to understand the investment philosophy of a manager. Many GPs, they are smart. You know, they also saw that there is an unprecedented value creation happening, by the way, in public markets, but also in particular in private markets. Many of the disciplined GPs, they calculated their pricing and uh, you know, their multiples on more moderate exit assumptions. Uh, I just talked recently to a very senior guy from one of the very, very large European um, GPs, and he told me, look, we anticipated a decline in multiples 
and are really, you know, making this up by the incredible growth uh, in the double digit number in our portfolio. So it depends on the discipline of the manager. And then, it, of course, it de uh, depends on, you know, when, when people have uh, deployed their capital. Okay. Um, another audience question uh, is now, um, is now a good time to invest in late stage or in early stage? That's a very uh, good one. Look, early stage, we see in, in both areas, uh, we see in both areas that the valuations came down significantly. I mentioned Klarna uh, earlier. Klarna is not only, you know, the it's a great company. So there are dozens of other examples out there where we are seeing that companies that are in need for cash uh, have to, uh, you know, cope and facing down rounds. So the opportunity set, I would say, is uh, very similar. Uh, probably, I would tend to say, um, you know, the early now invest into companies that are, you know, still in need for cash, but not in the need of cash as the later stage growth companies, which have in many, many cases high burn rates. And then, you know, by definition, if you play late stage growth, you're expecting mm -hmm. a, a shorter investment period than if you go into early stage. And uh, we talked about it, the exit markets are closed. I don't expect, you know, any major tech IPOs, at least not, you know, many of them in the years uh, to come. So your exit route, if you're investing now, is probably uh, not, not the best in, in history. Um, so look, for both their reasons, valuation-wise, I think there is a new reality from a risk profile, probably, you know, um, also, in a way, um, similar, you have uh, in, in late stage, of course, proven business models. But on the other hand side, you have in many cases incredible need for cash. Um, so it's both. We are at Moonfair. We are looking into both segments. Okay, good. Uh, good starting point so that I can go. I think this will be our last question. Um, and it's specifically to Moonfair. Could you explain maybe briefly, maybe we could do like elevator pitch sell a bit on Moonfair as a platform and especially how it works. Yeah, look, it's simple. And let me start standards. with the personal problem that I was facing when I left KKR. Uh, I left KKR in 2015 or so. And, uh, you know, I had the luxury in retro perspective that I could invest with relatively small investment amounts into the fantastic products at KKR. And I generated, you know, despite financial crisis and other stuff that came our way, a return of above uh, net 20%. So when I left KKR, I was really in desperate search for something similar because I couldn't invest anymore uh, with them. And in simple words, you know, you can now through Moonfair over a digital platform, invest into private equity, depending on the jurisdiction, starting at 100K, uh, and um, you have, of course, to be qualified uh, to invest, professional investor or qualified investor or semi-professional, different jurisdictions, but to, you can invest directly and pick and choose, you know, some of the best, most renowned private equity managers in the world, ranging from the KKRs down to the EQTs, Carlyles, you name it. Uh, we have some 20 to 25 funds in a given year on the platform in all types of segments, buyout, growth, infrastructure, secondary, credit, impact, and so on. And you can play private equity. And you know, why, why is it you know, smart to think about it? I'm not saying jump on the platform and do it. I say think about it. There is one step, and this drives really our motivation day in, day out, that keeps us busy. The average professional investor, institutional investor, average, is investing 25% of their assets, of their allocation into private equity. Some of the smartest investors on earth, endowments, Yale, Harvard, they are all over the place in the literature, really smart, invest smart investors, they do even more than 50%. And the ordinary, average, private, wealthy individual is at 3%. A huge mismatch. Uh, in 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 the asset allocation, you know, and you, we saw the volatility in in private in public markets. I, we spoke about it, the disparity between private and public. We talked about the active ownership model, which is particular in recession times, probably the superior model. These are all reasons to think about private equity, and you can do so. You can go directly into the funds and build your own portfolio, but you can also we have we call it one-stop shopping solutions. It's a given basket in a given asset class, a given basket of 
uh, top-notch private equity buyout portfolio, we have a growth portfolio, we have a venture portfolio. You can also put your money down into a diversified basket and then, you know, um, hopefully sleep well. And if worse comes to worse, I said it earlier, if people desperately need liquidity, we have a feature on the platform which is unique, by the way, globally. You can sell and buy stakes in these funds after a certain period. So you have a path to liquidity. If something unforeseeable comes your way and you suddenly need the cash that you have invested with us or through us. Okay, thank you very much. Looking at the time, I think that marks the end of today's webinar. Thank you, Stefan, um, for walking us through this topic and for sharing your insights with us and answering all Thank our you, questions. Yo -Yo. Great to have you. And then, um, yes, thank you to the audience. Thank you for all the great questions we got. Um, and thank you for joining us today. This video recording um, you can view on Moonfair's YouTube channel. It will be online in, in a few days. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about Moonfair in general, visit our website and register to learn more about our portfolio. Thank you. Thanks a ton Thank you, for everybody. joining us. Goodbye.